Hello and welcome to Bolt Action Reloading. In today's video we will be discussing if there is any value in adding neck turning to your match grade ammo reloading process. Stick around. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you would like to see how I and the rest of the community here make our group smaller, start now by subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon. That way you get notified when I post new videos and you won't miss anything. In today's video, we are once again going to be evaluating why you may want to think about adding neck turning to your match ammo reloading process. I did a video on this previously and seem to get responses basically all over the map. In this video, please at least let me go over the testing protocol that we are using as well as the tools that we are using to evaluate it. I do not want to tell anyone that this step is required or not needed. I also do not want to presume to tell you what equipment you should do or what you need to buy. There is higher quality equipment out there than I used, I'm sure, but probably lower as well, so everyone will still have to make the decisions for themselves. Please make the decisions that make the best sense for you. One thing as we go through today's video that I would like you to keep in mind is what I'm actually reloading for. I'm sure some of you are tired of me saying this, but the Precision Rifle Series style shooting is what I am reloading for. I want to be always able to reliably close the bolt, I want the rounds to feed smoothly. I don't want to risk any running any neck only size brass that might have one piece of dust in the chamber might make the bolt not run reliably. I just don't want to take a chance on neck only sizing and running into any issues when I'm trying to run reliable ammunition. If you choose to do that, by all means, go for it. It's your process. Keeping with this theme, I want to quickly reference an article published in December of 2015 by Cal Zanton of the Precision Rifle blog. He interviewed 100 of the top Precision Rifle series shooters and actually asked what the reloading process has entailed. Of those, 65% anneal and the second most popular step that some other reloaders might consider optional is neck turning, which was actually done by 53% of the top 100 PRS shooters. So obviously they feel there is some value to this. Keeping in mind guys, these guys are also using premium brass and still performing these steps. It's not like they're taking range scraps and, perform and performing this step. They're taking brand name, high quality brass and performing this step on it because they see value in it. Take that for whatever you guys want to decide. But another point to this fact that realize of those guys, only 12% of them actually even weight sort their brass. They're counting on the quality of their brass being so good that they don't even need to weight sort, which some would consider a much more important step than actually neck turning. What this says to me is that they feel the quality of their brass is so good that weight sorting isn't going to add any value, but over half of them are adding neck turning to their process because they see there is value actually in performing that task. And so obviously guys, I don't want you to take that I'm telling you not to weight sort your brass. Certainly if you're not buying premium brass, that would be a very important step. However, you still might want to consider neck turning either way. All that aside, let's actually talk a little bit about our test samples of what we're actually testing today. For today's test, we're talking about Hornady Brass. This all came from the same lot. 25 pieces of the 50 were neck turned and 25 pieces were left stock from the factory. I don't want to get into every single detail of how I did this. If you guys would like to watch my video, I will put a card up and you guys can check out the exact process that I performed on these 25 pieces to know the actual neck turning that I did. This is the same lot that I used last time when we did our neck turning test. And the only thing I did is put it back through my standard reloading process. Let's talk a little bit about the test we ran last time. Now, without getting too deep, I'll put a card up for that but as well. But to summarize that, we tested the 130 Nosler RDF, and that historically has really not performed well for me. Basically, and I'm summarizing here and making some generalizations, but basically, the neck turning load, not that it only improve our, improve our statistics, which still really honestly weren't good, but it did significantly reduce our group size. Most groups shrank from somewhere in the ballpark of 3 MOA all the way down to 1 MOA. So it certainly didn't make it a spectacular load, but it certainly took a load which I would never consider shooting and made it a lot better than it was. That video really raised the question, does it really, does it make a bad load better? Or can it make a good load even better than that? So that honestly is a little bit of what we're trying to do today. Keeping all that in mind, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about what testing we should run. For this video, I thought we might explore a load that might not be as good or bad and see if we do or don't really see a difference. So if you want to see the load results for the non-neck turn load, I'll put a card up for that, but we'll reference it in today's video regardless. So if it's not obvious already, today's load we are going to be working with 147 grain ELDM loaded with Alliant Reloader 17, CCI 250 large rifle Magnum primers, and obviously the prepped brass that we discussed earlier. Basically for today's video, the brass is the star of the show, and so I'm probably going to go into a little bit more detail than I normally would about the reloading process. 
The first step I do on my reloading process is decapping. So I've used my lead decapping die to decap all the brass before we did anything else. And if you're wondering why I do that, basically I'm just trying to keep the primer pockets as clean as I can. I'm not saying whether there is or isn't any value to that, but I feel with no real extra effort, I'm able to get a little extra cleaning through my cleaning process when I'm performing it. So obviously the next step after decapping, the brass is going to be wet tumbled through my standard process. Do this as you think is correct. I'm certainly not going to argue how to wet tumble brass. I usually run mine between two and a half and three hours, depending, with a solution of some type of dish soap and a little bit of lemeshine. More soap than lemeshine. Our neck turn brass was obviously neck turn before this entire process was done and has only been done one time. Both sets of brass were annealed, though I will admit slightly different settings because some material has been removed from the Nectarn brass. If we were to use the same setting, our Nectarn brass would likely be over annealed, plus damaging it. The next step, both sets of brass would have been full length resized by Forrester, full length resizing dive in 6.5 Creedmoor. But as you can see, I actually would have removed the entire decapping assembly since I've already decapped the brass. And instead of using the expander that comes with the die, as many of you may be aware, I actually use a Sinclair expander mandrel to open the necks up. My setting, I full length resize, set the shoulder back about two thousandths, open it up very specifically with my neck turning mandrel, not the expander mandrel, but my neck mandrel, to set my neck tension at essentially two thousandths. After all this was performed, any excess brass would have been trimmed off by my Gerard trimmer, and my final overall length of my brass would have been 1.910 inches. After all that was performed, I would have again ran a very quick cleaning process, less than 30 minutes, just to remove any lube and brass shavings from the brass so they would be ready to reload. If that's too much detail for you guys, I apologize, but that's as fast as I get through it and I thought some people would be interested. Obviously, the next step down the road, we use CCI 250 Large Rifle Magnum Primers. Like it or not, guys, Magnum Primers is what I've been using, so that's what I continued on for this test. In today's testing, we're going to test five different charge weights, all over Hornady's max stated charge. Please don't just run out and duplicate this. Please remember this is a learning experience here. I have experience with this powder and this projectile at similar charge weights. I suggest you do the same before you jump straight over max load to try and duplicate any of this testing. So, five different charge weights going from 40.6 grains all the way through 41.8 grains of Reloader 17. This test may have been slightly more impressive had we chose a temperature stabilized powder like Reloader 16, but this is again what we use for today's testing. Our projectile we chose for today's video is the 147 grain ELD match, part number 26333. We've used this many times here on the channel, had very acceptable results, hasn't been too difficult to get groups that were less than an MOA. This projectile has a great ballistic coefficient, G1 of 0.697, G7 of 0.351. And getting to a reasonable velocity, we can keep this load supersonic well past a thousand yards. The cartridge overall length that we chose was 2.870 inches, which I don't have any trouble running in my Magpul AICS style magazines. All that load information out of the way, let's get to the results. This will be in my normal style, but I encourage all of you to stick around because we'll have some additional analysis after this. And if you cut out early, you're going to miss out. I promise. Also, I want to encourage you to look a little deeper at the groups and the overall statistics as we go through there. I do not want to make any excuses for my shooting, but as we go further on, we're going to get look a little further in the analysis. I don't want to blame any of the particular group sizes for being any worse because of the load, because I'm sure my shooting played some type of a factor into this load analysis. To ensure we're offending everyone, some of the groups we're going to discuss are four shot versus five shot. All that out of the way, let's get right into the data. So as I say this, we'll be alternating, so we'll talk about our stock brass first, and then we're going to discuss the results of the same load in the neck turn brass. So starting off at 40.6 grains, our estimated velocity would have been theoretically 26.75. Our actual achieved velocity was 26.56. Standard deviation of a horrid 21.9, extreme spread of 55, and a 1.032 MOA group. Moving to the neck turn load at 40.6 grains, our estimated velocity was still 26.75. Our actual achieved velocity was 26.62, standard deviation of 5.1, extreme spread of 12, and a 0.563 MOA group. If we stop right there, everything would be much easier, but that wouldn't be any fun now, would it? At 40.9 grains, our estimated velocity went to 26.94, our actual achieved velocity went to 26.72, standard deviation of 16.4, extreme spread of 39, and a 0.891 MOA group. Moving on to our neck turn load at 40.9 grains, our same 26.94 estimated velocity, actual achieved velocity was 26.77, standard deviation of 10.1, extreme spread of 25, 
and this is where things will get more controversial. If we actually take all five shots, our 1.921 MOA group will seem less than spectacular. If you'd like to cut a little bit of slack and do four shots, 1.040 MOA group, or if you want to get rid of the two bad shots, a 0.369 MOA group. You guys decide, I don't even really honestly want to get into it. At 41.2 grains, our estimated velocity of 2713. Actual achieved velocity was an even 2700. Standard deviation of 10.9, extreme spread of 26, and a 1.224 MOA group. Here's where I might give the stock brass a little bit of a mulligan. The three shot group of this group was really, really good. Not that I took any measurements. The four shot group was okay. Very well, this might be a good load, and the shooter ruined this one. But you guys decide for yourselves. 41.2 grains in the Nectarine Brass, with the same estimated velocity of 27.13. Actual achieved velocity was just 4 feet per second higher at 27.04, obviously compared to the Stock Brass. Standard deviation of 11.6, extreme spread of 30. And if you want to talk 5-shot group, 1.002 MOA, but if you're willing to give it a mulligan, 0.513 MOA, 4-shot group. At 41.5 grains, our estimated velocity went to 27.31. Actual achieved velocity was 27.21. Standard deviation of 19.2. Extreme spread of 46 and a 0.876 MOA group. Going to the neck turn side at 41.5, same 27.31. Actual achieved velocity was 27.11. Standard deviation of 6.3. Extreme spread of only 14 feet per second. 1.077 MOA 5-shot group, but a 4-shot group of 0.492 MOA. At the max charge we tested today at 41.8 grains, estimated velocity would have been 27.50, actual achieved velocity was 27.44, standard deviation 19.9, extreme spread of 56, and a 0.942 MOA group. The neck turn load at 41.8 grains, still the same estimated 27.50, actual achieved velocity was 27.38, standard deviation of 16.8, extreme spread of 44, 5-shot group of 1.062 MOA, but a 4-shot group of 0.558 MOA. So a couple quick takeaways, and then we're going to dive into something new here on the channel. Looking at it real quick, I do think that there is a measurable improvement in the neck turn loads. Low, some of the groups don't necessarily show that. It does seem that there is at least some measurable improvement with the neck turn loads, though I'm sure we can argue about that forever. Our average velocity between the sets is actually virtually identical. If you average the velocity on all of the five shot groups on each set, you're actually, your stock brass is only 0.2 feet per second larger on average. So basically, what I'm willing to say is in the noise. Standard deviations are pretty much better overall with the neck turn brass, but certainly not in all cases. Funny enough though, looking at some of the raw data in this testing, it might not be blatantly obvious that there is much of an improvement with neck turning. But before we go on to that conclusion, let's just look at the data a little bit differently than we're used to. One thing I want to mention before we get into this, I do not want to take any credit for anything we're about to discuss. The sheet that we're going to use actually came from the 6-5 guys channel. I will put a link in the description box below so you guys can go check out that video. And if you find it interesting, you can actually download it from their video. So go watch their video, understand how it works, and download it if you'd like to use it yourself. Personally, I think they've done a great work on their channel with both Lem and Scott Satterley. And today we're going to be using it to illustrate some of the differences, and I think that's really what this load needs. Try and bring you guys up to speed, and just in case you don't watch my channel every single week, let's talk a little bit about the Scott Satterley load style just for a minute. I'll put a graph up on your screen, and theoretically, this is what I will call a Scott Satterley load development style chart should look like. This chart was made from the data that they did on his 10-shot load development video, and basically shows how velocity can plateau and then increase drastically and plateau again, and how to find those plateaus and use those to find a load very quickly with not very many shots fired. Basically, as you can see, we're looking for these plateaus, and if we reload on those plateaus, what our obvious goal is, we're going to find a load on those that should have low extreme spread and standard deviation load performance. This might strike some people the wrong way, but if you believe in optimal barrel time, I do believe this is real. This is more than likely the way that really should look like. If we're not being able to see this with our reloading process, maybe we really need to reevaluate some of the things we're doing with our reloading process before we start criticizing that this style of reloading doesn't work. Putting up a standard chart real quick. So assuming that we're looking at this chart and just charting the average velocity with stock brass, this response is almost linear. Obviously, the more powder you add, the more velocity you get. It does make sense. However, it really doesn't seem to jive with what we hoped our optimal barrel time reloading development style would produce. Adding the neck turn brass, we can obviously see where the neck turn brass demonstrates slightly more of a plateau response that we might be looking for. But if this is all the day we were looking at and we stopped right here, we might feel that we should move on to some other type of combination. But honestly, this is where I think Steve of the 6-5 Guys' spreadsheet really shines. 
When using the 6-5 guys spreadsheet, we will see that all the velocities are actually plotted on the same chart, along with our average velocity and other information. To start off with looking only at the stock brass, notice on the chart the velocities as they're plotted. Again, nothing really special here. So we're looking at the data we'd normally be looking at. We really don't see much different. 41.2 grains would probably still be the charge we would pick, but if we were really honest with ourselves, an extreme spread of 26 really isn't what we're looking for. In addition, that was a 1.224 MOA group. Three shots were touching, so blame the shooter as much as you want, but I'm really not sure what we found there and if it's any good. Now, let's add the neck turn data to this chart. A pattern certainly becomes more obvious, at least that's the way I feel. Now, looking at that 41.2 grain charge, you would initially see, oh, an extreme spread of 30, looking at all the points on the chart, you can see that that is largely because of one outlier in the group. In addition, even though we saw an extreme spread of 14 on the 41.5 grains of neck turn brass, it's far more clear looking at it this way that it is very likely that we might go back and find a possible sweet spot somewhere in the middle of 41.2 and 41.5 grains. And assuming those two shots really are outliers, we really may just end up with a load that shoots somewhere in the ballpark of a half of MOA at 2710 feet per second which, in my opinion, at least, is pretty good. It certainly gives us no guarantees, but it is likely very promising in my opinion, and at least gives credence that the neck turn brass did improve our load measurably in this case, and was certainly worth the time that we took to do it. Now, discussing the brass from another aspect, pressure. Looking at the brass here, we can see there's really nothing specifically that makes me nervous on the brass. The primers are not overly flattened, there is no ejector mark on the brass, and nothing that really concerns me or makes me feel uncomfortable. In fact, it actually makes me feel a little bit more comfortable that all the way up to 41.8 grains, we really didn't see any pressure, which makes you feel a little more comfortable since Reloader 17 is not a temperature stabilized powder that even if it was a little warmer outside, we wouldn't run any pressure signs and start doing anything like blowing primers. But as in all things on the channel, I will let you guys decide in the end. Does our testing today give credence to actually neck turning our brass, especially since we likely only would need to do it one time for the life of the brass? Other things that we might need to think about here is if we were using more premium brass, depending on your feelings on Hornady brass, of course, it's not probably the best brass, but it's not the worst either. Does this possibly show we are more justified in spending money on premium brass if we could possibly skip this step and find similar or better results if we went straight to Lapo brass? On the other hand, we haven't done this testing with any of our premium brass. Is it possible we're actually giving up some accuracy there as well? It would be interesting to know if we were giving up some performance on those loads simply because we weren't neck turning those cases as well. I would love to hear your thoughts and comments in this section below on that. All of that being said, I'm not sure they'll ever see it. A big thank you to the 6.5 guys as well as Scott Satterley for all the effort they have done sharing information with others on their channel about load development and especially sharing their personal tools with the reloading community to help us improve our load development as well. I'm really thinking of continuing the use of this spreadsheet tool here on the channel. I really think it adds visual element that we've been missing in previous load evaluations. I'm really interested to know what you guys think. Is it worth spending some time on that when we do our load development to see if our standard analysis is really missing something that we're just not seeing? Well, whether you see value in neck turning your brass or not, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have any comments or questions, please post those in the comment section below. If you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification so you won't miss next week's video. And until then, stay safe in small groups.